Welcome to the 12th virtual agritourism gathering. My name is Lisa Chase. I'm a professor at University of Vermont Extension and the director of the Vermont Tourism Research Center. And today we are going to be talking about agritourism as a tool for rural development and women's empowerment. We developed this virtual series about a year and a half ago as a way to stay connected during the pandemic. And we are now planning ahead through May with at least one virtual gathering each month leading up to the International Workshop on Agritourism that will take place in person in Vermont and also online. The dates are August 30th to September 1st of 2022. So mark your calendar, save the date. Let's take a look and see who is actually getting our emails and who is here with us today. I just launched a poll that says, describe yourself, check all that apply. Please go ahead and check as many boxes as hats that you wear. And I know that many of us wear many, many hats. Um, and also take a moment to introduce yourself into chat. In, in the chat. Make sure that when you type into chat though, you click everyone. I think the default is hosts and panelists. If you are comfortable sharing who you are, send chat to everyone and let them know who you are, where you're from, and what your interest is in agritourism. I can't wait until we're all together in Vermont and we can look around in the room and see who's here with us. I get the privilege of looking at registration. So we know we had about 200 people registered from over 30 countries. It's, and it's a very impressive group. Hopefully many of you will introduce yourselves in chat and you can see who's here in the virtual space with us. Um, looking at the poll, you can see we've got about a really good mix. We've got a little over 20% farmer ranchers, and extension service providers. And we've got, wow, almost 40% researchers and quite a few tourism professionals, business owners, educators, government agencies, and nonprofits. And now, now that we know who's here with us, let's move to our topic for the day. I wanna introduce our moderator, Dr. Claudia Schmidt. Claudia is originally from Germany, but she has studied and worked in Canada. And currently she is an assistant professor of marketing and local and regional food systems at Pennsylvania State University with both a research and an extension appointment. Her focus is on diversification options for agricultural producers with an emphasis on agritourism and craft beverages. For several years now, Dr. Schmidt has been studying women in agriculture, and she has done some extremely interesting research on gender and agritourism that will be published very soon. We are fortunate to have Claudia here today with us to share her research and moderate the discussion. Claudia? Great, thank you so much, Lisa, and uh, welcome to everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us. So um, I will start with a research overview for the United States, uh, and then we will move on to uh, Claudia, Maria, and Elena. So women in agritourism are foremost farmers, and they are operating in the agriculture policy environment in the United States. So before focusing on agritourism, I just want to circle back and provide a really quick overview about women farmers in the United States. So first, there is a lot of research out there, at least when it comes to, to economics, on women farmers in developing countries and not so much uh, in developed countries, specifically in the U.S. And uh, that attention to gender um, has changed just recently. It also came with the release of the new agricultural census, which is conducted uh, every five years in the United States. So these maps you see on the left, they show the development of female principal operators across the agriculture census years. So you can see that the share of female operators has quite increased over the, over the past years. In 2017, we see a, a major shift because there has been a major shift in the census. 
uh, because now the census counts up to four operators on a farm. So you can see now way more female farm operators uh, that are counted and uh, we cannot really compare it with uh, previous years. So studies that looked at the available data and literature from different areas of study found that, so different areas of study, I mean, agriculture, economics, rural sociology, anthropology, and so on. So female farmers still have lots of issues with accessing land and credit, so-called old boys networks, um, issues with childcare, and they also have to fulfill multiple roles on the farm, which also increases um, the pressure. Right. So the first economic study in 2020 found that women farmers on average um, earn 40 percent less than male farmers. Uh, this is the Fremsted and Paul study, and they actually said that farming is one of the most unequal professions in the United States today. Uh, in a recent study, we looked at the characteristics of female farm shares at the uh, at the county level. And we found that a higher share of women farmers can be found near metropolitan areas where you have more horticulture, um, small livestock and agritourism. Um, also, Van Zen made that connection between female farmers and agritourism. So from data and surveys, we know that probably more women are engaged in agritourism. Um, I won't bore you with too much research. I just want to talk a little bit about it. So we don't know, are women successful in doing agritourism? So the evidence is kind of mixed. Um, there are only a handful of studies that look at the difference of gender in agritourism. Uh, most of them point out that women generally earn uh, less income than their male counterparts, which is mainly based on the different goals they pursue. The recent survey, there's a recent survey study from Savage published in 2020, and they conducted a survey just with women agritourism operators in North Carolina, and they looked at their attributes and found that younger and higher educated women farmers entered agritourism. Um, they also had a preference for sustainable agriculture practices, and they had an interest in the overall well-being in their community. And this is really a theme that goes throughout all of those studies. However, <clears throat> there's a caveat as always, it has also been questioned if women working in value added agriculture and rural tourism, they can be seen as reinforcing this traditional gender role. So um, we're looking at typical women's work. So by taking care of visitors, are we just falling back into um, gender stereotypes? Uh, a qualitative study by Hali et al. Uh, was conducted in 2016, and they looked at the elements of success for women in agritourism. Uh, I won't read them, but you can see uh, there are many more reasons for women to start agritourism activity on their farm, and it's not solely profit. Um, a research team led by Lisa Chase uh, conducted an agritourism operator survey in the United States in 2019 and 20. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right before the pandemic, we closed the survey. Um, and here are the demographic results for the uh, over 1,400 responses. Uh, there already have been a couple of presentations about the survey before, so I just want to highlight um, a little bit the differences between the genders. So more women responded and they were younger on average, um, had less acreage and less experience um, than the male respondents, but they were also more educated. And uh, we do acknowledge the caveat that women are generally more likely to answer surveys and they might not have been the sole agritourism operator when they answered. So I'm just going to highlight some points. Here are the types of farm experiences that the survey respondents offered. Uh, here we can see that more women offer educational experiences and entertainment and events and outdoor recreation and lodging. But you can see definitely more education and more men gained income from on-farm direct sales, at least in our survey. Uh, so what made our farmers start with agritourism? Our survey asked about the motivations and our respondents' goals. Here we can see that for most goals, the responses from men and women were uh, very similar. Uh, one category that stands out again is the educate the public about agriculture. So women were more passionate about it, the women that responded in the survey. Where 90% of the women, they rated it as very important and an important goal. Uh, so now the motivations are one thing, but how how successful are these operators with these goals. So this slide shows the percentage of respondents who felt that they're successful in achieving these goals. 
Um, so the interesting thing here is that more male respondents said that they increased traffic to on-farm direct sales and diversification and an increase in farm ranch revenue. And you can see that in the responses where the female respondents exceed the male responses, more women felt that they succeeded with their goal of educating the public about agriculture. We also conducted some regression analysis. That's a study Lisa mentioned, we're working on it. And we found that women agritourism operators make significantly less profit than their male counterparts. And they're less likely to assess themselves as being successful in um, increasing farm revenue. So in conclusion, um, while more research is needed, as always, um, it's evident that women in agritourism in the United States uh, may pursue different goals when they start to offer agritourism activities on their farm, and they don't solely uh, focus on creating income. Um, other more, you know, other goals, educating the public and inter interaction with the public are very important as well. And I'm almost at the end. If you want to learn more practical info about women in agritourism in the United States, uh, I have two great resources for you. Uh, there's some great work from North Carolina State Extension Tourism. They developed a couple of educational videos to increase women's recognitions as farmers and agritourism providers. The link is uh, down there. And then uh, there's another resource from us here at Penn State Extension. We interviewed five women across Pennsylvania, and they shared their take on uh, production, human resource, and legal issues and how they dealt with these. And these videos are available on the Penn State Extension website. Um, I am now going to introduce our next speaker, and I'm going to stop sharing my slides. And Amelia will actually share the slide for Claudia. So Claudia Gil Arroyo is originally from Peru. She is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Parks, Recreation and Tourism Management at North Carolina State University. Her current research focuses on craft beverage tourism, but she also has worked extensively in agritourism and has some great publications out there, check them out. She has developed research projects on uh, community-based tourism, food tourism and agritourism in Peru and the United States. Over to you, Claudia. Thanks, Claudia. <laughs> um, so we heard uh, Claudia uh, talk about um, the role of women um, in agritourism in the US. And although we can all agree that this, I guess, traditional roles and perspectives of women can be universal, there are some, certainly some um, cultural aspects uh, that might not translate um, to developing countries such as Peru. Um, so we did a, um, a study in 2015 uh, where we talked to seven different Andean communities um, located in, in Peru. Um, and we found out that um, traditionally these are very, uh, we have men led communities, like men are decision makers, men are the ones that handle the money. Um, although the work in itself is usually pretty um, evenly distributed, like they both farm, they both take care of everything, but the man is usually the decision maker, the one that voices opinions and, and um, sort of takes care of the family. Um, but we also saw that when these families started uh, offering agritourism activities, whether it was, you know, textile or, or um, doing some farming demonstrations, uh, weaving, pottery, whatever it was that they were sort of offering to tourists, uh, most women were the ones taking the lead on this, which was very interesting. They were the ones uh, that started, that showed the most interest in participating, the, the ones that really encouraged their families to be part of it, the ones that took care of it. Uh, they're the ones that perhaps during community meetings may not have a whole lot of voice and do not make uh, much decisions, but when it came to tourism, they're the ones participating in fairs, they're the ones talking to um, tourism providers, they're the ones really taking the lead and making themselves heard. Um, that was sort of like on the political side, we also see that they're also the ones that tend to take advantage of most of like the educational opportunities that come along with tourism. For example, traditionally in these communities, um, they mostly speak uh, a traditional language, which is called Quechua. Um, and only men are, or men are in most cases, the, the only ones that speak Spanish. 
uh, but with the introduction of um, agritourism, then a lot of these women were encouraged um, to start learning in Spanish, for example. And every time there is a, a training opportunity, whether it's like learning to cook for tourists or learning alternative ways of, of doing handcrafts, for example, um, they are the ones, again, that take advantage of or um, are the ones taking these opportunities, right? And trying to learn and make the most out of them. Um, and they also uh, appear to, to be much more participat participative in social spaces. Again, usually the men were, would be the ones that um, take the lead and participate in any sort of um, social gathering. Uh, but with the introduction of tourists, then women start to feel much more comfortable talking to outsiders and learning to speak to them and actually showing interest in learning about um, these foreigners. And finally, uh, their participation in agritourism also allowed them to generate this extra income um, that they could, you know, pretty much decide where it would go to, which is not something that they would traditionally do. As I mentioned, men were usually the ones that manage the money and decide where it goes to. And, and this way they could, you know, use it for their kids or any treats or whatever additional things they would like. And again, this is this. Um, has improved sort of their standing and their empowerment and also their identification with their own culture, right? Because they become, they have become with, with this empowerment and with this um, uh, practice and offering of agritourism, they are becoming sort of like the ambassadors of their own culture because they are the ones that are truly realizing how important it is to get their, their culture and their traditions out there and they are very much interested and willing and, and excited to share about it and sort of share its value with it. And again, it comes all from, from women. Women are, are the ones uh, that, that are really being benefited by this. Um, so that's just a little bit of what we found, but this was a qualitative study. So for sure there is a lot more that we could learn about on, on how these female roles um, are evolving and changing within these communities. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Our next speaker is um, Maria Baria Mushara, who has uh, 35 years of experience in sustainable tourism development and women empowerment across East Africa. She is an Ashoka Fellow and the founder and CEO of Kabadi Uganda, a not-for-profit community-based tourism initiative Maria received the Award of Excellence from the Government of Uganda in recognition of her outstanding contribution to the promotion of uh, women, uh, tourism and women empowerment. Maria is a mentor and motivational speaker on issues of rural women and youth empowerment. Welcome, Maria, and please go ahead. Thank you, Claudia. My name is Maria Maria Mashura. I'm from Uganda, East Africa. Next, please. Okay, I'm the founder and CEO of Kobat Uganda, an award-winning NGO promoting tourism for sustainable road development and women empowerment across Uganda. I have over 30 years experience in sustainable tourism development and women empowerment across East Africa. Over my course of uh, tourism participation, I identified a gap between mainstream tourism and local people, their culture, their environment, and uh, they were excluded from the opportunities within tourism. So as I went along in tourism, doing mainstream tourism, tour operations, travel agency, and all that kind of, uh, I, 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 the, I, I kept re realizing the gap. So this in, in, in inspired me to, 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 to do something about it. So I started my, my, my NGO, Kobati, which is an acronym for Community-Based Tourism Initiative, to be able to mentor and also teach local people that uh, tourism is good and it has potential to improve their, li their, their lives if they could participate in it. But because of that gap, as most of Africa countries uh, or the African continent, 
we inherited the, the, the colonial uh, type of, of, of tourism where tourism was developed at the expense of, 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 of local people where people were displaced and all these big lands were turned into national parks for the colonial you know, people like officials to 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 visit and 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 and, and do uh, and to do safaris when they they had their visitors they would take them to national parks so that is what tourism was uh, was and still is in a way that you, Uganda's tourism or most of Africa's tourism is wildlife based and people just come view game and go back. So that is where that gap, which I mentioned first, came. That the local people, rural areas, their culture, their, 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 their way of life, they were never part of the tourism picture. So for me, that's what made me realize that I needed to do something. So in, in 1997, I, I went to Israel and I did a course in rural tourism development as a tool for income generation. And then that gave me an eye opener on how tourism is done besides wildlife. And then I came back empowered and I started mobilizing our people. I started uh, advocating for, for inclusion of, 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 of local people into the tourism marketplace. I also started uh, advocacy to, 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 to link tourism to other sectors of the economy. Because so that they could also, tourism can also be seen not purely just as for, as, as as a leisure or as as, as as a product for for just going to national parks. But uh, once it's linked, to, tourism is linked to agriculture. Like we can know we can do agri tourism. Once it's linked to education, people can 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 do. People who have got schools, people can do tours. People who can, you can link it to health, and you you have like health health tourism which was not understood. So that's what I've been doing through my NGO, which is a not-for-profit. And that's how I became an affair because of being a social entrepreneur in, the, in that. So back to women and uh, my role in empowerment of women. I focused on women because of course they, 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 they are disadvantaged at most levels and in, in, in rural areas. And then I, I looked at tourism and then, and then I, I looked at uh, the rural areas, because like 90% of Ugandans uh, live on practice agriculture. And uh, most of them are do livestock keeping and, and crop growing. And the majority of them are in the countryside, they are subsistence farmers. And women do all the work, like Claudio said, it's always the women who do the work and, 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 produce, and help in the farm. But then women don't own land. So land is owned by men and the cash crops are, 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 are for, I think that's universal. The, the, the cash crops, men take the, 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 the money from the cash crops. So now I, uh, what I saw in Israel, what I saw that there is need for people who, are, who, who live in urban areas to have a place where they can get away and, and relax and, 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 and breathe fresh air and eat food. Then I realized that was the entry point and I realized that women, can have a, a, an advantage over that. Because in Africa, uh, women are, they always do hospitality. They host, they make food, they, they entertain visitors, they care, they make handcraft. They, so the potential was there. There was not, they are not going to do something new. So I, 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 I zeroed on, 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 on the women especially women communities living along tourist uh, circuits where it was easier for channeling the, 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 the travelers or tourists working with the tour operators to go to these villages. So what I, 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 I identified even, even when I was young, I could see my mother who was a typical rural woman. She, 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 she worked with her hands in partnership with my, with my, with my father, but we had cows, cattle, and, and then crops. My mother was in charge of growing the crops. We had a big banana plantation. My mother worked with her hands. She could do the agriculture part, plant, 
uh, the, the harvest, prepare, and then my, my, my dad will sell, will, will sell. But still my mother could do other things. She was gifted. She could weave baskets. She could do, do pottery. She could do beading. She could, she could, she, she could do needlework. So all those things she could, she, she could do. So that's why I, our, under our home, because we had food at our home, people would come to buy food, purchase food from our, buy milk from our, from, 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 our, from our farm, buy, you know, potatoes, you know, banana planting, all those products. So people came. And then also because we had food, we could host, my parents could host like on festivities, people would come and spend like Christmas or whatever that. So I realized that my mother was always hosting and entertaining and she, she would give away those uh, uh, products, the mats, the watchers, gifts. Uh, so that's what I used when I started this journey of community tourism and, and, and mobilizing and maintaining and skilling rural women to participate in tourism, but tapping into their culture, their way of life, their, 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 their environment and what they know because they didn't have to go to school. You didn't, we didn't have to teach them anything. They didn't have to move from their areas they needed. What we did or what my organization does is to train them into food presentation, high, uh, homestead hygiene, sanitation, uh, cross-cultural exchange, how to, and, 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 that, and that's it. The good thing about Uganda is that Uganda, most people in, in Uganda can speak English because we are, English is our, is, is, is our official language. So even in, in, in rural areas, even children in primary schools, they can interpret for their parents or the, 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 the local youth. Also, I, I, I put them in that, also in community tourism so that they could also become guides and interpreters. And we developed like village walks where they could, they could take people, visitors along, 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 along the journey. So on these slides, you could see how women have been, for the longest time, African women do crafts, they do mats. So these women in this village, where, whom I found that they, 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 they do hard crafts for home use, for, for, for giving. So they, 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 the economic part of it was not there as, as such. So through mindset shift, I told them, if you can move, do these baskets, you can now do baskets which can become like a, attractive to people who, who they can take them. And then I told them to keep the story because I, I told them that because African crafts have stories and I think it's the story which sells. So there are different uh, uh, handcrafts for different occasions. So I said, if you can do a mat, you can do a, a shopping bag, you can do a sun hat. So now we did value addition. So now women started getting money as tourists would come, they would they would sell their hats. They would sell they would sell them the the, the the shopping baskets. They would sell them stories about the food. Then they would they would host. So we started also homestead tourism, also for the, for the women. But all those things were in the villages. Then we also looked at the rural environment and landscapes, beautiful landscapes as you as you, as 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 you as you can see. So basically, that is what we use as part as part of empowerment, uh, because. You, we, are, we, 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 we do not even look, look at, the, at, at the, the impact was not on the, only on them, on the income. It was also on the welfare of the children, on the family assets, which increased, on, 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 on keeping traditional skills and indigenous knowledge. In this picture, in this slide, you can see we have women, rural women who, 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 who do pottery traditionally. So we, we, at Kobati, my, my, my organization, we have holiday camps for children in urban schools. So we bring them to these villages so that they can learn, uh, they can learn like pottery, they can learn like weaving, traditional dancing. So this is what I do. And when we mobilize women, we also pass on the information about, uh, about, about health, about, uh, you know, like family planning, about uh, saving. Each woman, they, we, they have saving groups. So they save part of what they, the, what they buy. If visitors come to the community and they, say, and they, and they buy them the, 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 the baskets or, or, or they, they do the food, they have a certain percentage at which they save. So they have a saving group. And from the saving, these women are able now to, 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 to give lunch to their children because in Uganda, we have universal primary education. Everyone goes to school, but they don't provide them with, with, with school lunch. So now the women are able to provide lunch for their children. They're able to provide 
sanitary towels for their girls to stay in school. The, and one of the things which I realized the impact at one occasion event when we are celebrating the, 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 the project in the village, one woman stood up and said that uh, because of uh, the project, because of her now getting money from, 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 from their craft shop, her husband treated, started treating her differently. So it's also like one of the impact is uh, deterring like, uh, you know, domestic violence and also like keeping girls in school who used to, go to not, not stay in school because of, uh, you know, of the issue of, of sanitary towers. People becoming empowered in that way and families starting looking at, and also the two operators and, 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 and starting looking at, at rural areas as viable uh, tourist destinations. And they started also the Ministry of Tourism now is, look, is, 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 is now into listening that we are going to start agritourism, which I started with the farmers because in the farming, in the farmers, they are, they are beekeepers. They are, they, they, then there are, are people who are doing grapes, they are doing wine in, in, in river, but they were just doing it for sale. But now visitors are coming through us. They are coming to see how it's done, the story behind it and also to see the women who are empowered. And because of war, Uganda, we've had in a, a number of, 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 of war. So men left, maybe were joined the army or men died. So there are a number of women headed household who are, who are owning farms. And, that, and, and they, 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 they are setting like a good example in their communities. They are empowered women. They have their own money. From long ago, when I was a young girl, as I said, I saw the impact of a woman having her own money. My mom had money of her own from the, from, from, from the, the sale of her handcrafts, from, from hosting and from selling the crops, which were not uh, the commercial ones, which my father wa, 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 was in charge in. So as, as we went to school, my father would just give us school fees. How much is school fees? How much is pocket money? O official one, that's what he would give us. But my mother, because she had her own money, she would give us extra money for, 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 you know, for grab or she, or she would, she would. So I saw the impact of that. And then I saw that how my mother was, a, was a strong person in the community, how our home, was, she was respected. My father respected her. So I grew up knowing that, and that's what I've used. So for me, I'm, I'm advocating for agritourism because especially now, with the COVID, we are no longer able to mobilize the women, but they still have the skills. Once it's, it's, it's open, the women will just start doing what they do because they don't have to move to cities. They're still, they, start, they keep doing what they do in their own villages. And I'm sure that, that the travelers now, once uh, the, the people are vaccinated and they start like moving domestically, people are going to come to rural areas where there is a fresh air, where there's green landscape, where there is organic food, where they, they can travel in groups and stay in these farming families who are, who are practicing agritourism in groups. So that's what I'm seeing and that's why I'm excited and, and advocating for agritourism. I'm excited to be on this platform to learn how it's being done. But in Uganda, agritourism, as far as I'm concerned, as far as my organization is concerned, it is the real thing for empowerment of, of not only of women, but of local people and rural areas. Thank you, Maria. That was wonderful and very passionate. It really shines through. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is, uh, is Elena Yelenkovic. And I know you're gonna share your slides now. Um, Elena is the uh, executive director of Wines of Macedonia and an executive director of M6 Training Center. In her role as uh, director of M6, she designs different leadership programs and trainings, many of which are focused on women and youth empowerment in Macedonia. Uh, she is a consultant for the Rural Coalition and uh, focuses on the personal development of young people and women in rural areas. And she was a project manager of a Macedonian urnogastro tourism project, which was financed by the World Bank. Thank you, Elena, please go ahead. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it is a pleasure to be part of this uh, event today organized by University of Vermont. I had the privilege to visit Vermont uh, last month uh, on invitation of uh, US Embassy here in, uh, in the country. Uh, we did discuss uh, further possible cooperation. And uh, today I would like to 
let's say, share with you uh, what is going on in the country and in the region related to agritourism and women empowerment in this sector. Uh, before we continue, uh, I would like to start the poll now. Uh, can you answer the question? Do you know where the Republic of North Mauritius Estonia is? Share the results, please. It's a surprisingly, <laughs> uh, yes, but never been there, five, 55%. Uh, we have 35% that uh, no, never heard about where the country is. Uh, so we are, what are we facing uh, here? It's a small country. Uh, rarely somebody knows where, uh, where this country is. Uh, and uh, we will talk about tourism and especially agri-tourism or uh, any kind of tourism. So when you are facing a problem, actually, uh, about brain building, about uh, when people don't know where the country is, how can you expect the tourists to come? So there is a, a, a further discussion on that we will finish uh, by the end of the presentation. So uh, we say here Macedonia is in Europe. It's a landlord country. It's really uh, close to Italy, Spain, it's on the Mediterranean. We have a population of 1.8 million people uh, on the last census. So it's pretty much close to uh, many uh, famous tourist destinations, uh, but it's very uh, hard to get the tourists come here in the country. Uh, what are we facing? What are the challenges? What are the potentials of uh, building tourism, especially agri-tourism in the country? Uh, the main focus, because I'm representing Wine of, Wines of Macedonia as association that is uh, actually uh, covering all the biggest wineries in the country, uh, with export more than 90% of the total uh, wine uh, export in the country. Uh, we are doing some projects related to uh, promotion of the country and wine uh, industry in the world. You can see that uh, if somebody knows about the winemaking regions, there are famous winemaking regions and Macedonia is with, between the 30th and the 50th uh, uh, parallel. So it's very adequate for uh, wine production. We say it's a land of nature and cradle of culture. Uh, being part of uh, a land of part of the, the world with a long history of uh, where, where it's the crossroad of the civilization. Uh, there is a mixture of culture between Byzantine, Slavic and Ottoman influences. So uh, not speaking only about uh, agri-tourism, we can always combine the cultural tourism uh, within the any kind of uh, tourism. So. We say Macedonia is full of colors. Uh, when you, one of the main focuses on the projects that related to developing of tourism in the country is uh, adventure tourism as well, because we have a mountainous terrain. More than seventy-five percent of the the country is uh, covered in mountains. There are thirty-four mountains with more than two thousand uh, meters altitude. 43 lakes and four national parks. And the climate is Mediterranean and uh, it's suitable for healthy grapes. Uh, you can see the, some of the pictures showing colors of uh, our country where agriculture pay, plays an important role in uh, Macedonia and uh, in its third largest sector after services and industry. And vineyards area uh, represent uh, up to 10% of the total arable land. Uh, with uh, agriculture still, still being the main economic activity in the rural regions, however, the small agricultural holdings still face challenge, challenges to ensure uh, quantity as well as to meet the food quality standards and food safety requirements, uh, making their products less competitive on the national and international market. That is one of our uh, challenges. Uh, the agriculture contributes uh, to more than 70% of the country GDP and employ significant percentage of the population. Uh, so in the last year, it was 18% of total employment, but it's decreasing and it, it is now 14% of the total popula population and employment in the country, uh, which is pretty much higher than the European Union 
So people related to agriculture in European Union, it's only for around 4%, while here it's still higher. Uh, and we have uh, low pro productivity. Uh, since I'm representing Wines of Macedonia, one of the, let's say, the ambassadors of our country, uh, we have uh, evidence of uh, winemaking here since the 13th century before Christ, then it developed. It, it slowed down du du during the Ottoman Empire, uh, but now uh, the winemakers are uh, implementing newest technology and trends, and uh, uh, wines from uh, our country are beginning to be recognized and uh, being uh, side by side with the best wineries, wine regions in the world. As I mentioned, the climate for development of agriculture and uh, wine tourism is uh, very convenient. Uh, we have more than 20, 280 sunny days per year. Uh, and um, Mostly so far, the agritourism in Macedonia um, is related to any kind of tourism. Mostly the people coming to the country are coming to see the Ohrid Lake and Ohrid is uh, so-called European Jerusalem with 300, uh, more than 360 churches. So that's part of the cultural tourism. And uh, due to mountains, uh, as I mentioned, uh, most of the focus is adventure tourism. But any kind of tourist, uh, tourist coming to the country is always sitting and enjoying uh, the best food and the best wine uh, from the region. Uh, so combine this, uh, we say that the, the agriculture and wine industry are uh, our country ambassador and has a high potential. So the so-called enogastro tourism has a high potential for uh, developing uh, tourism in the country in general. Uh, there are many investments in the last couple of years uh, on this field. There are European Union World Bank projects related to uh, rural development. Uh, some of them uh, have uh, focused on women in the rural areas uh, development and the country support via subsidies. So uh, the, if it's a woman working in the rural area, it subsidizes more and than the men. So this uh, actually, this kind of actions and the IPAR projects uh, actually motivated uh, people uh, to turn back to the nature, let's say, and uh, that is why we are, uh, we can see good examples of uh, many projects related to our topic today, uh, which, is, which are related to women empowerment. Uh, I will fa go fast now, there are many events that we can use uh, to develop this sector. So to increase the offer and create uh, customer experience, the first section is, uh, there are pictures of the wineries, they are investment. Uh, as I mentioned, there is a World Bank project uh, that uh, actually helped to develop different capacities in the country, especially in the wine uh, sector. You can see uh, that there is an enogastro offers related to wine uh, wineries uh, offers. But there are many events. Uh, you saw that we have a big tradition of, uh, let's say, cultural tradition. So in the back uh, days uh, before Christ, uh, there were wine and wine celebration days of Dionysus. So we can use this kind of events actually happening always during the whole year, celebrating wine. Some, uh, so like, for example, St. Trifon Day, uh, when you can see that more and more wineries are actually welcoming their guests uh, and uh, actually promoting and combining this enogastro offer, uh, which means that maybe we can uh, 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 hope to promote the country, not uh, just for the regional tourists, which are mainly focused on coming to the country, but maybe for international tourists as well. That is why uh, our association in, uh, initiated Vranets World Day, we celebrate it uh, like Malbec Day or uh, Sauvignon Day, etc., etc., just uh, to promote and um, establish uh, the country as a wine country, to promote it internationally. That is why we are organizing field trips, press trips, uh, when, where we invite international wine media, just to make this 
brand building and international promotions. Uh, on the next slide, you will see a couple of projects that were uh, actually funded by different uh, organizations such as uh, Swiss Embassy, uh, USA, USA Embassy, uh, GIZ from Germany. So many investors coming and in, uh, investing uh, to develop these projects, but you can see many different, you can see the links. So uh, there are videos available, uh, but it's not organized. So some of them are related only to support women. But to summarize, at the end, uh, what we need to do is prioritize, to define it, this sector, agriculture or agritourism, uh, as a competitive advantage and make adequate uh, actions. So um, to, sorry, to have um, higher investments that are required to stimulate and restructure and improvement of the competitiveness of the agri sector through structural policy measures, especially measures that support investment in new technology, the infrastructure, which is uh, in order to improve the connectivity. So you saw many examples here on the pictures, but uh, we are lacking of uh, good infrastructure to connect the, uh, the places. Uh, what we need is to define some regional proje projects maybe because uh, think about it, you're coming, you're coming for example from USA, uh, it's very hard to project that you will come to see only uh, North Macedonia and these couple of places. You would uh, most probably want to see Serbia, Bulgaria, Albania, to go to the sea, to Greece, etc., to combine it. So we need to define some regional projects to broaden up the perspectives uh, in order to, uh, to build this uh, sector uh, to be, uh, let's say, more uh, economic, uh, to drive economic development of the country. Uh, then, um, what is needed? Uh, we need the education in terms of uh, motivating uh, people in the rural areas, especially women entrepreneurs, uh, to, to educate them to uh, have hospitality uh, uh, skills, uh, to, to be able to have international marketing, marketing to promote and attract uh, visitors. And at the end, uh, the country brand building. So Macedonia, as you saw, it's very suitable for um, creating uh, artisan food and um, develop, uh, develop the country and the, the whole sector and the whole region as well, maybe together uh, to attract foreign tourists, not just regional tourists come here to, to the country. And I hope that next time on our poll, we will have more people that were there or knows where the country is. Thanks, Elena. Thank you, that was a great presentation. Um, we have a couple of questions. We don't have much time. We have about 10 minutes for, for Q&A. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to push it forward. There's one question, um, Maylene asks, uh, so I don't really know who's meant by this. Can Carla please comment on whether there is an intergenerational challenge when passing down traditional skills and farming techniques to younger women? And are they taking up the mantle to keep traditional craft and other agritourism experiences? Since we have two Claudias, I think we're just going <laughs> to share this one. Claudia, would you like to go ahead? Sure. Um, actually, there, there, there's always these challenges as uh, younger generations are exposed to other um, types of societies, big cities. Uh, they tend to want to leave behind this all this um, heritage that they have. But what we um, witness in these communities is actually that the growth of agritourism, the, I guess, influx of, of, of um, tourists has actually motivated these younger generations to be more interested. Um, and women, all the generations also make, uh, I guess, I don't wanna say they didn't make the effort, but, but if they weren't interested in it, they just, you know, let it go. But this is something that has encouraged both sides to be more, um, involved, I guess, and, and making sure that these um, traditions and, and all this um, cultural heritage gets passed down. I know that in some cases it has even some traditions that were completely 
um, ignored for a, a while. Like there's, I know there's one of the communities in Puna that do, do this really intricately decorated hats for some celebrations, stop doing it because the, their their kids were not interested. They were not really celebrating that way. They would all wear, you know, the regular everyday clothes for these festivities. And as um, agritourism started picking up and they started incorporating more cultural elements to it, um, they, they saw how people were in awe of how cool these cats were. And so they started using them again, making them again and teaching their children how to make them as well. Thanks. And uh, in case for the United States, as I mentioned, we're going to share the question. Um, we're still um, analyzing the, the national survey with Clemson University. So Lori Dickis and Olivia McNarlin. And uh, what they found uh, when looking at the, at the comments that, that producers gave was that women are really interested in keeping the legacy of the family farm. And this is why they're engaging uh, in agritourism. So there is this interest to pass it down and it's actually made possible through agritourism. We have another question uh, for Maria from Fen Yang. Um, what are the challenges to scale up agritourism in Uganda? including regulatory issues and how supportive the government is to use agritourism as instrument for rural development and gender equality. And this is the first question. It's a two part question. And then the second one, um, it sounds very detailed. Do you plan to collaborate with Eco Village Network in the region? <laughs> okay, for agritourism, like I said at the beginning is a is something new which which has come up, which uh, the the minister of of tourism is is now like uh, getting interested in, uh, because of uh, you know people are coming up with with farm farms people like farmers like people who are doing coffee who are doing tea who are doing like uh, pineapples big farms so. People just come to, 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 to learn how they are doing it. And as they come to learn, they come in groups, even like university students who are, who are doing, doing agriculture, they come to, to learn to, to see what's happening on those farms. Then for the, the, like our pirate farms, where because of, of the mentoring we do, we said that if people come to, to, for educational purposes to this farm, they are about certain people. They have come. You would, they would, they, you, they, they would, they would see what is, what happens and whatever. But they would need like food. They would need like a drink. They would need to to use the washroom. They would need to, to take away something, but maybe some some of the food. So when we started doing that, and then in the meetings we go to, and also people share, uh, having interest, those. Those, those visitors who come and go back to report to say the Minister of Tourism, they, tour, they tell poor operators. So that's how it has now come. And now also the government is involved in, 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 in development of rural areas, in people supporting small farming families to, 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 to grow food and also to, 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 for, for eating, and all, but at the same time for, for, for income generation. So people are starting to do smart farming. And as they do that kind of smart farming, farming becomes interesting. And then also younger people, because there have been, there's a lot of unemployment in, 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 in Uganda of, of, of university graduates, because they have been looking at agriculture as, as something which is local, which is you go back to the land. But with agritourism or with smart farming and agribusiness, it's now starting to look interesting, also to interest young, young people through very addition. So because there are farmers now who do livestock, they do uh, for dairy, dairy production. So now the younger people are coming in to add value to start doing like yogurt, like cheese, like, so now it becomes, farming becomes attractive. And rural people, as people come, as, 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 as people get more income and improve on their, on the infrastructure of their home states, now they attract visitors. So what we've been advocating for now becomes meaningful. So now the Ministry of Tourism has come up and put agritourism on the forefront of among the, the, the projects they are, they are what? They are, they, are, they are promoting. 
uh, like three months ago, our organization signed an MOU with the Ministry of Tourism to one of the things we are going to do together is to promote agritourism, skilling and mentoring and, you know, de developing to uh, tourism, small tourism enterprise, village enterprises, that kind of with support from the Ministry of Tourism. So that is what is happening and, and that's what, what, what I can say, what the, the governments are coming up with good policies of rural development, but also which link up with tourism development, in, which are favorable for agri tourism. Thank you so much, Maria. And I'm so sorry, there's so many more questions in the UNA, um, but we just have to cut it off here because Lisa would like to uh, wrap it up at the end. I would like to thank all the speakers. Thank you so much for sharing your, uh, your, your insights. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Thanks to our speakers and thanks to everyone for joining today and putting great questions into the chat and also and Q&A and also submitting them in advance um, through registration. We didn't get to all of the questions, but we will send out an email afterwards that will have the resources, the links that we've been putting in chat as our panelists have been speaking. And also all of our panelists today have agreed to share their contact info, their email um, and social media channels. So we'll send all that in an email later this week. We wanna keep this conversation going with all of you not only on this topic, but on other aspects of agritourism as well. As you can see on the slide on January 18th, we'll be talking about booking sites for farm stays and experiences, how to reach your target market. Registration is already open for that and posted on our website, agritourismworkshop.com. Hopefully you'll get our emails um, with more information and um, we're continuing to plan ahead for the next several months. So um, keep an eye on our website and um, stay in touch. Enjoy the upcoming holidays and we hope to see all of you next month. Thanks so much, everyone. <laughs>